The following program is made possible with support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Heather Berlin. And I'm Faith Saley. Science Goes to the Movies is all about movies, TV shows, pop culture, and science. Today, we're going to talk about mythic creatures. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is the screenwriting debut of the multi-talented J.K. Rowling. In this soon-to-be-released film, Newt Scamander, played by Eddie Redmayne, arrives in 1920s New York City with a briefcase full of magical creatures, which sends the fanatical New Salem Philanthropic Society, an organization dedicated to the eradication of wizard kind, into dangerous overdrive. Welcome to New York. We're delighted today to be joined by Mark Norell, Division Chair and Macaulay Curator, Division of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for joining us. I, I dare say you're the best dressed guest we've <laughs> <Absolutely>. ever had. <laughs> That's style. I can compete with you guys. <laughs> So in this film, we discover that the American term for muggles is nomage. And we three here are yeah. American nomage people, and we have two scientists to boot. Um, yet you, Mark, uh, curated a very real and fascinating exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History that took a serious look at the natural history of fantastic beasts and where they come from. Yeah, it was a, a little away from what my usual research is, but I like to pick projects that I can learn a lot doing and that also I've always been intrigued by art history and the way that nature is depicted in mythology and then visually depicted in paintings, sculpture, and architecture, and everything else. Dragons appear in almost every fantasy story we read or watch, and almost every culture in the real world has a dragon myth. Do these fantastical beasts have paleontological underpinnings? It depends on which dragons to begin with. I mean, there's cases of dragons in Western Europe where in churches in Eastern Europe that they have things like the skulls of woolly rhinoceroses that are supposed to be the, the, the dragons because of these were, you know, people in the old days were a lot more familiar with animals than we are today because they actually butchered them, they cut them up, and they knew what the bones looked like. And they knew when they found something that wasn't one of their sheep or their cows or something, it needed some explanation. So a lot of that then came from religious texts, local myths, they said, well, this is it. We have evidence that this, this kind of dragon actually existed and that, that usually brought to a church or a wealthy person's house. So it could be just kind of like a misinterpretation of the you know, bones that they found and then they created a sort of yeah. dragon-like creature which they thought might have actually existed. So yeah, it wasn't exactly. really mythical, it was kind of like science in a way, or just yeah. misguided science. Well, for, for, for some of that, but you know, the other side is true too. I mean, certainly you know, dragons are mentioned in a lot of religious texts in the West, uh, certainly in the East, but there's a big definition between, or differentiation between dragons as they exist in like the Asian mind and in the Western mind. So why, why is that? Like, why is it that the European dragon has like wings and limbs, and why is it so different than the Chinese dragon, which is sort of more snake-like? There's been a lot written on that subject of what the differences are, but I think that you know the, the big ones is that if you look at the, the Western concept of the dragon, so much of it is tied in with Abrahamic religion, is that it's it's considered to be like this, you know, that uh, uh, would have to do with the loss of virtue. It has to do with 
guarding treasures and it's ferocious and it's mean and it's something which has to be killed like it's you know a tool of the devil whereas in asia dragons are beneficent beings so that they exist and that they exist actually in you know the duality between what's real and what's not real within a lot of traditional asian culture is that yeah you know that i'm I live around like a lot of Asian people, and they would think, "Yeah, you know, dragons exist because if they're in their mind." Really? They, they, well, they're, yeah, they exist as something in their mind. You can't visualize them necessarily, but they're also considered to be beneficial because I think that if you look at the Harry Potter iconography and everything else, you know, dragons are usually pretty mean, and there's something they have to deal with all the time. And things in Asia, the number one year you want your kid to be born in year is of the, the year dragon. of the dragon. I had a year of the dragon baby. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. And I remember so. reading that year that that Chinese couples were like going crazy for IVF, right, to make exactly. sure they had a year of the dragon baby. Exactly, exactly. But also, if you look at you know the dragons in uh, in Asian culture, especially like you know the one up on the screen that I can see right here, that these are chimeras. Is that there are lots of different animals that have pieced together. They might have the head of a camel, that the horns of a deer that the uh, claws of, of a, a tiger, the scales of a carp, the body of a snake, so that they are things that sort of personify a lot of the attributes of all of these, these different animals. So does this also apply to other kind of mythical creatures? Like what about mermaids? Yeah, uh, I think that, you know, that, I mean, that's really when we did the exhibit, that's what it was really about. It's like that, that there's a couple of different ways that you can imagine a mythical creature. One is either that it's something which is deep-seated within religion, whether it's like local religion or folk religion or real religion, or it's something which that people have seen someplace and they don't really have an explanation for it so that they kind of, you know, make something up. And, uh, and then there's, the, you know, this other type of just, usually the, they're hybrids of things that uh, just come from folk tales. And, you know, mermaids are like that. And just like dragons, there's all different kinds of mermaids in different cultures around the world of, you know, things that are half human, half fish and live in the water. And mm -hmm. that they're, 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 uh, they're not just, I mean, different cultures have mermaids that aren't just lovely yes. women with long hair. And yes, yes. Oh. And even, you know, in, even, I mean, these myths, you know, we can sit and laugh about them all we want and say this is, and no, look at these different sorts of things. But, uh, people really thought this stuff was real. I mean, it's like that there's an excerpt from one of Columbus's diaries, for instance, when he was sailing around the Caribbean and he was at this island and he said, well, we're here and there's mermaids all over the place. He goes, and what were they? He goes, but, but it, then he said, you know, but they're far more ugly than anybody really ever says they are. <laughs> and they thought that they were dugongs and manatees. Manatees, this yeah. is what I heard. This, I read this yeah. once yeah. on the ground. Those would be some fat mermaids, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they like their mermaids thick. Yeah, no matter what mythology in any country you're in, so much of it, whether it's you know, modern, whether it's animated, whether it's been made into a popular book or a popular film, is all based on historic stories. That, and that's, I think, been one of the big appeals of, of J.K. Rowling's books and things, is that there are things that you know, kids would read them, they could talk to their grandparents about and things, and they would recognize some of the old English terms in, in them. Mm -hmm. And I, mean, I think that really happens universally all over the world. As far as it, it being based on any real evidence, though, it, that's really tough to say. And there's only a few cases in antiquity where we know that specific animals were based actually on things people found. And, what are they? Well, probably the best one is the myth of the Cyclops. That one was that there's Greek uh, vessels, which, you know, the classic Corinthian orange on blackware, that have pictures of skulls on them. And then they're labeled. And one of them says, the Cyclops. And anybody who knows anything about you know, the anatomy of animals can tell that it's a little elephant skull. And it wasn't until about... A little elephant skull? Yeah, about 250 years ago that uh, people started finding little elephant skulls in caves on some of the islands in the Mediterranean. And it's this phenomenon scientifically we call island dwarfism. I mean, it's mm -hmm. a, on uh, the islands off California, the Channel Islands, for instance, that there were, there were relatives of mammoths which reached four feet tall when they were adults. So and, did they look like a cyclops because of where the trunk where the, had been? Exactly, where the oh, nose yeah. is, there's that oh big gosh. hole. So and they found it in a cave, and they just, the myth of the cyclops was probably already existing, except that they go, here it is, this is evidence Proof. that we have the cyclops. And but even, I mean, flying dinosaurs and that kind of thing, I mean, those could be like dragon, dragons. They could be, but those weren't really recognized. The first one of those wasn't found until the early 19th century. And ah. Uh, Harry and his friends are in uh, mostly in a house called Gryffindor, uh -huh. and a griffin, of course, is is an animal yeah, that's yeah. half 
eagle and half lion, right? So yeah. is it, where does that come from? Does that uh, Well, certainly griffins, art historically, are one of the earliest creatures that have been, I mean, there's ones on the gates of Ur in Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. for instance, so that they go way back and that they've, there's different forms of the griffin that have pretty much been adopted by cultures all over the world of a, you know, flying animal with a lion's head. And even in ancient Egypt, there's uh, ones, there's ones in, from the Tang Dynasty in China, the Han Dynasty in China. But there's no, you know, paleontological um, origin Not really. Of that? I mean, I mean, we're, you know, it's hard enough just being a paleontologist in general to be able to like determine what an animal looked like and yeah. what its capabilities were from the bones. And certainly that uh, the things that we can really tie paleontological evidence to is in the broad sense is giants is that people would find like the, uh, a well-preserved either dinosaur bone or more likely a bone from a Pleistocene animal like a mammoth and say, well, this is one giant thing. There's nothing around here like this now, so this must have been from a giant. This leads me to a question. Can you please define paleontology? Because I think yeah. a lot of people hear it and think, oh, that's dinosaurs. Yeah, well, paleontology is basically that the, it's a science that is devoted to studying ancient organisms. So those organisms could be chemical traces left by organisms, microscopic organisms, all the way to dinosaurs, all the way to fossil mammals and everything else. It's a little bit different than, different than archaeology because I know I'll probably, you'll probably get tons of letters about this. Archaeology is not really a real science in the sense that it's, it's people, Snap. well, people go through archaeology and anthropology programs. Traditionally, those are, have a very, very liberal arts basis. They don't have to take those awful physical chemistry and organic chemistry classes and they don't necessarily. Um, Indiana Jones. Yeah. <laughs> what was he? Was he a paleontologist? Was he archaeologist? Was he archaeologist? Uh, I think that he was probably represented a, a phase in the history of museumology basically. It's one of these big collecting phases that started basically like in the Napoleonic Wars and then it kind of existed all the way up to the beginning of uh, you know, the 30s or so, when museums around the world were going to places all over. There was really no laws about repatriation. People could just go in anywhere they want and take anything they want, like Napoleon coming out of Egypt with the Rosetta Stone and that uh, the Elgin Marbles and all these other kinds of things that existed and stuff. Well, so. now, sadly, in, in world affairs, people are destroying ancient things rather yeah. than, you know, keeping them for themselves. I, yeah, I mean, it's terrible. I mean, it's a... Uh, and I, I mean, I know it's quite controversial, but you know, the, the international museum communities are having these ongoing discussions about that what is better? Is it to have a cultural patrimony in the geographic country that it exists now or to disperse it? Mm -hmm. And also just with ancient- Protect it. Yeah, who owns dinosaurs? Yeah. When you, when you find a bone, you, you work in Mongolia a yeah. lot. So you find dinosaurs there, whose are they? Uh, well, our contract with the Mongolian government is that everything that we excavate remains property of the Mongolian government. So we get to bring it back to New York to study it, and it gets Mongolian Academy of Sciences catalog numbers on it, and it's going to be returned to Mongolia someday. They don't really have a research facility right now that they'll be able to hold all of it, but some of the more charismatic specimens that we have returned and that they do display in uh, the capital of Ulaanbaatar. What about the, I, I mean, my fantasy is Jurassic Park, right? Uh -huh. is, that, is that a possibility now with technology and, and uh, the genome, could we recreate these animals? You know, kind of as a scientist, I'm never going to say anything is impossible, but I would say within the prevailing sort of concept we have of, of molecular biology and developmental biology, that it's impossible right now. That even theoretically impossible right hmm. now. So. Is that a relief to you? Or would you like there to be reanimated living dinosaurs? Uh, I mean, that's a question people ask me a lot, and I know that this lets a lot of people down. I'm not really that interested in dinosaurs, believe it or not. Really? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that uh, I'm interested in science. And, you know, and that, well, uh, what question would you want answered? Like, what's, we, what's uh, The way we think of things, like, we're, you know, we'll, I'll be out with my graduate students. We'll be having a lab meeting, like an Irish bar or something. We'll sit there and we'll say, well, uh, what color are dinosaurs? And... Uh, no, we'll go, you know, like, well, how can we figure that out? I'm sorry, we've all, we, we point this out a lot. It all happens in bars. Scientific <laughs> yeah, it does. all happen yeah. in bars. The, the yeah. double helix on a napkin <laughs> in a bar. But yeah. So, yeah. But how can you, can you tell the color of dinosaurs? Yeah, how? yeah, a couple of different ways. One is that there's these uh, very tiny bodies that exist in the skin of all animals called melanosomes. And, you know, now that we know that most dinosaurs were feathered, if you have very good preservation, 
you can find the melanosomes in like 120 million year old feathers. And you can take and you can look at melanosomes that are in the feathers of living birds. And then you can use a mathematical technique called uh, geometric morphometrics, which allows you to mathematically describe those shapes and then do a predictive analysis that this shape melanosome is going to be this color. And then we can't see the actual color in the fossils, but we can see the melanosomes. So we can just plug that into so that model. I mean, were they like, were they like peacocks? Were they all, well, what colors wait, were they? You're blowing my mind. Can, I just want to be, I heard you correctly. Most dinosaurs had feathers? Yeah. yeah that's yeah, a yeah. new thing. That's I, a new I discovery. I missed that, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> you okay. gotta I mean, you we're, know. Scientific American. We're going to do, there's a show opening at the American this Museum really called Dinosaurs Among Us. And I think it's really going to shock a lot of people when they walk in and we have recreations of things like tyrannosaurs and stuff that are fully feathered over mm -hmm. their entire body. Mm -hmm. So to Heather's question, what color, yeah. were they vibrant? Well, the melanosomes don't tell you if they're vibrant. The melanosomes tell you if they're white, they're black, they're brown, or they're reddish. However, that- uh, Is there a pink dinosaur? Please say yes. Well, Please say yes. there probably was, but there's another technique that we have to do to do that because the, the melanosomes are really structural color uh, that are preserved forever. A lot of the colors, the really flashy colors we see in like macaws or parrots or flamingos, a lot of that color is imparted by different what are called chelated organometallics that, ex that are different oxidation states of common metals like copper, like iron, like titanium, like manganese. Some of the specimens that we've worked on, you can see that this animal called Microraptor, uh, it had a lighter colored underside, it had spots on it, it had a dark colored upper part. And we could even tell because the melanosomes were aligned end to end that they worked like a diffraction grating so that they were iridescent like a blackbird or you know, something you would, you know, a uh, starling or something you would commonly see today. Cool. This fall, Pixar came out with a film called The Good Dinosaur that suggests an alternate reality in which an asteroid never hit the Earth and both dinosaurs and humans walked on the planet. What asteroid? What, what asteroid is this? <laughs> uh, about 65 million years ago, there was a big asteroid about six kilometers ac across that smacked into the planet off the Yucatan Peninsula, or what's the Yucatan Peninsula today. And there's a lot of discussion about what happened next or what happened before. Uh, you know, there's the prevailing discussion is, oh, here we have the answer that this killed all the dinosaurs. And, you know, the planet went dark for a while. There's all this acid rain because of all the dust that was ejected into the atmosphere and things like that. There's incontrovertible evidence that the asteroid hit. So nobody's arguing that. I think the effects of it, however, that asteroid is, a, is another problem because that certainly dinosaurs seem to be decreasing, traditional dinosaurs, not birds, uh, seem to be decreasing as we reach that time period worldwide. Uh, there's other major events, like the world's second biggest volcanic event ever to happen in the history of the planet is happening in India at that same time period. Mm -hmm. The climate is changing rapidly because is that the oceans that used to fill the major continents uh, where the Great Plains are today and where Central Asia is today were drying up. So there's lots of stuff going on. The other thing is that the dinosaurs didn't really go extinct. I mean, we just call them birds today. I mean, birds are more closely related to Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor then Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus rex are to any other dinosaur you've ever heard of. What? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then why don't we have ginormous birds left as vestiges of their ancestors? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, that there certainly were birds which were present on the planet uh, in Madagascar, for instance, elephant birds that were about three times, four times the size of a living ostrich that existed. Did they fly? They couldn't fly. They were flightless, but they were, they were, they were, present when humans first got to Madagascar, even when Western Europeans first got to Madagascar. Did dinosaurs live all over yes. the Earth? Yes. So uh, six kilometers for an asteroid, that's pretty darn big, but, yeah. but surely that pokes holes in that theory. I mean, it, how would it wipe out dinosaurs absolutely everywhere? Because what, w you know, that's a big thing. You just you know, imagine the amount of force of it hitting and being vaporized. Mm -hmm. the, the first thing that would happen is it would dig a big hole. In, in the planet, a really big hole in the planet because it's coming in really fast. And then all the parts of that hole, the ejecta, would fly out through the hole that was punched in the atmosphere by the thing. So it would go global and it would just coat the entire planet with ash. Uh, also just the physical energy of it, it's predicted that it would have made the entire atmosphere glow like a microwave for about 30 seconds after the impact. Mm -hmm. But have you ever found, you and yeah, your, yeah. Co your, your people, your uh -huh. colleagues, found Dinosaur feathers? Yes, a lot. Well, 
a yeah. lot, okay. a lot. Even feathers on relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex, close relatives of Tyrannosaurus rex. Most of this comes from this area in northeastern China in Liaoning province, and it's an area where the, there was almost constant volcanic activity that was going on for about 30 million years and preserving things in lake beds. So you get uh, this airfall ash, and you get unbelievable preservation of soft tissues. So we have animals that were fully feathered, and you can see all the feathers. And wow. not only can you have see Have you the, been there to witness it? Yeah, yourself? we've excavated some of them. I actually was part of the, a team with uh, Chinese colleagues who described the first ones. Is uh, that so cool? I mean, how, tell us the truth. How cool is your job? Depends on which day it is. <laughs> so, so, so give us the most exciting day in your job ever. Uh, what, was it, what was it? I don't know. It was a pretty exciting day in 1993, in the kind of early days of the Gobi expeditions, that we were traveling an area of South Gobi in a place called Omnagov in uh, the Nemec Basin. And we found this fossil site that is the richest fossil site that's ever been found in Mongolia. And within the, a couple of days, you know, we found that uh, embryos of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. we found lots of Ma the mammals that lived with the dinosaurs, and then I found the, the animal, one of the nests where the, the, uh, the parent was sitting on top of the nest of eggs, brooding it like a modern bird does, so. In 2011, Ralph Gardner wrote an article in the Wall Street <laughs> Journal about you, yeah. and it was called The Coolest Dude Alive, and yeah. said that you I'm had- I'm glad I was out of the country when that came out, <laughs> believe me. Is that right? <laughs> well, they also said you, he, he said you had the most impressive office anywhere. Um, yeah. So. What do people not know about being a scientist? I mean, you seem to have it, besides the way you dress, you seem to have it going well, on. Well, I mean, Why? science can be really fun. And, you know, that it's, and it's one of the reasons that uh, when I kind of diverted my career early on to, to work on dinosaurs, because that yeah, I could do probably even more precise science than I do on dinosaurs, like on lizards, because they have a better fossil record. But if I was just doing all this stuff on lizards, I wouldn't be sitting here. Because dinosaurs, because of people's real interest in them, it creates a natural way that you can able to transmit science to a much broader audience than just working on lizards is. And, and a lot of the things that, you know, we, I mean, as that, you know, one of my colleagues puts it, you know, that dinosaurs are kind of the entry drug for science. Because is that, you know, you can go and you can talk about evolution, you can talk about earth history, you can talk about engineering and, and biomechanics. And you can engage and you, children. And you can engage people in it who otherwise would think that that was the most boring subject on the entire yeah. planet. So. You know, Mark, they say that kids play reflects the culture of their times. And, yeah. you know, at the turn of the last century, it was cowboys and, and guns. And then in the 50s, it was a lot of, like, spacemen. Yeah. And, and of course, I think probably at least from the 80s, right? It's been dinosaurs, dinosaurs, dinosaurs. Yeah, I would kids. say, yeah, I would say that, uh, I mean, I, people say, oh, was all this caused by the first Jurassic Park movie? And certainly I don't think so. I mean, I think the Jurassic Park took advantage of this kind of fermenting interest in dinosaurs that was occurring about that time. And that uh, it, Why do you think, though, it kind of happened in, in, in the last part of the last century? I think things are cyclical, and I think that it also kind of corresponded when uh, a time when much more more precise science as well as more international expeditions started to go out and find a lot of things that people would read about in the papers and that kind of thing. But I think also that people are just, that also happened about the time that a lot of major museums were renovating their dinosaur halls and that kind of thing. And that for some reason, no matter where you go, like you can go to the Gulf, like, you know, Qatar, Dubai, you can go to, you know, Southern Africa, you can go to Asia. And no matter what culture people are from, that they're interested in seeing either dinosaur skeletons or the prehistoric remains of other animals. Even if they don't even think they're prehistoric, they're just into it. And Do you think it's their, maybe their link with these mythic creatures and beasts we've been talking about? I think that could be some of it, but I think that the, myth, the reason that people are interested in mythic creatures is the same reason they're interested in dinosaurs, because I think people are naturally curious and they're pretty smart. And because we can't actually go out and physically observe these things, living and interacting, it's a natural place for the, their brains just to work out on and to be able to imagine things. And that as a scientist, what you do is you try to channel that imagination into something which is 
testable and repeatable, so you actually learn something about the world. And it also gives people, I think, just like you know, we were interested, we're interested in outer space, and and mm -hmm. dinosaurs. It, it's something larger than us. It's like you know, it puts our human existence uh -huh. into perspective, yeah. and that is a part of the attraction. And also, just now with new technologies like CGI, you know, and and the animations that they are so realistic mm -hmm. that it's become you know, when you have movies like Jurassic Park or even these now these new Pixar films. You know, they really become real creatures, mm -hmm. and so that's why I think you know it's regenerated this this real this resurgence of the excitement yeah, yeah. about these, and I mean, these think animals. That, I mean, it's been going on long enough now that we're you're seeing the second generation of it. You're mm -hmm. seeing like you know people who kind of grew up with it, like in the '80s and stuff, and their kids are into it. And at the museum, we see a lot of that and stuff, where that uh, you know families coming in, and uh, you know, I mean, I think that it has some holding power, and it's actually kind of become part of international culture of you know the, of dinosaurs so. do you have a favorite dinosaur or mythical <laughs> beast or fantasy movie uh not really uh you know it's a, it's a like a friend of mine in the movie business says that uh what's the worst thing she ever did what she just finished what's the best thing she's ever ever did uh, what I'm working on now. What's going to be the greatest thing ever? What I'm working on next. So it's kind of that kind of Godzilla. thing. Godzilla. <laughs> it has to be Godzilla. Come on. That's uh, <laughs> well, that's all we have time for today. Well, great. Well, it's been wonderful talking. Thanks so much for coming yeah. by. Thank you. Yeah. I can't wait to see your next exhibit. Yeah, it's going to be good. So, Don't forget to check us out on the web at cuny.tv under the Science tab, where you'll find past shows, additional content, and a link to our app. Thank you.